Dave Upthegrove is currently the chair of the King County Council, and he is running in this year's election to be Washington Commissioner of Public Lands. He joins us now to talk about it. Council Member Upthegrove, how are you? Welcome. I'm great. How about yourself, Stephen? <laughs> I'm doing just fine. Uh, and, you know, we're e- excited to talk about this because obviously I know that, you know, uh, environmental issues very, very important to you. You've had a very successful career in public service by any standards. You uh, were a state representative for five terms. You are now in, I believe, your third term uh, as King County Council member. You say that you see the Public Lands Commissioner position as, as like the culmination of your life in public service. Talk about that. How so? Sure. Well, first I'll say why I'm running. Uh, you know, our world is changing around us. You look around, we're experiencing the impacts of climate change. We're seeing a rapid loss of biodiversity, both globally and locally. And I'm running for lands commissioner to improve the management of our public lands to meet these realities of today. And like you said, for me, it isn't a stepping stone to higher office. And it it really would be the culmination or the capstone of a life and career that's been focused on environment and natural resource issues. It feels sort of like coming home to what led me to public service in the first place. And by way of background, if uh, my whole love of the outdoors began in high school and college, when I spent all my summers out working at a summer camp out on Dave Bob Bay, teaching young people about environmental science and ecology. I spent a couple summers leading week long treks through the North Cascades. And then my whole love of politics developed as uh, an environmental activist on campus at the University of Colorado where I got my degree in environmental conservation and biology, later got a graduate certificate in energy policy. Uh, And then, as you noted, I went on to represent my community, the diverse working class suburbs in South King County for 12 years in the state house. And natural resources really was my focus. I, as chair of the House Select Committee on Puget Sound, I worked with then Governor Gregoire to help create the Puget Sound Partnership to protect our crown jewel. Uh, Later was the chair of the House Environment Committee, where I got to work all over the state in every corner on pollution issues, climate issues, uh, and was most proud of managing the legislation in the House that successfully shut down our state's last polluting coal plant. And we did it in a way that took care of the community and the workers. Um, And when I was in the legislature, I also uh, served as one of the leaders of a progressive caucus called the Blue Green Alliance. Blue for blue collar workers, green for tree huggers. And we realized that by working together, we actually could get a lot more done. And we, we rejected that false choice between jobs and the environment and actually worked together to advance a sustainable economic uh, agenda. And for that, I was honored to be the Washington Conservation Voters Legislator of the Year. And since then, I've been on the King County Council leading local efforts to manage growth, parks, recreation, land use, and really proud of my work. It, it, this puts your listeners to sleep, I'm sure, but uh, the, I uh, led the <laughs> King County Flood Control District for many years. And the stranger actually put a bunch of Z's like they're falling asleep when I tried to discuss that in my interview there. But that, that, really that sounds about my- right uh, for our friends at the stranger. Sure. Yeah. But I I took over that. That had kind of been the playground of the rural conservatives on the county council. And I strategically took over the leadership of the King County Flood Control District, a large, well-funded government people don't know about, and really reformed it to better protect our rivers, to do integrated floodplain management. We doubled our salmon recovery funding and uh, and currently serve as chair of the Ryan Nine Green Duwamish Watershed Council. And so Uh, I think we need a lands commissioner who not only has those strong environmental values, but also uh, the relevant background and experience and record of accomplishments to be effective. I mean, you're you're covering so much here, and I, I very much want to dig into uh, so much of what you've, you've just laid out for us there in terms of your past work on environmental issues. But, you know, for the uninitiated, can you just tell us briefly what the public lands commissioner does? <laughs> this is not a job that's on most people's radar screen, uh, right. but the... Commissioner of Public Lands serves as the director of the State Department of Resources and is responsible for managing our state's public lands. So this is not a regulatory agency like the Department of Ecology. It's a land management agency, and it manages millions of acres of uh, timber lands. That's probably what gets the most attention. I hope we get to talk about forestry policy. We shall. But it also oversees the management of aquatic lands. Um, and also agriculture lands, as well as real estate holdings. And 
our state constitution and state laws require us to manage those for the benefit of certain trust beneficiaries, uh, our schools, colleges, and local governments. And the courts have granted a little more flexibility in recent years. Um, but at the end of the day, we are stewards of those public resources. And my philosophy, uh, particularly on these timberlands, is that we need to remember that. We need to remember these are public lands. They don't belong to the timber industry or to the agricultural industry. They belong to we the people. They're public lands. They're our lands, and they have to be managed for the public interest. Put a pin in that because I do want to come back to that. Um, I, you, you talked a little bit about your, your work uh, and your time as state representative, including the Blue-Green Alliance. So as you say, this pro waiver pro-environment coalition, a lot of times, as you say, these two things can be seen to be in tension. What if you could unpack this a little bit more for us, talk about the dynamic and really how you feel the interests of labor and the environment can both be served, particularly uh, from the perch of public lands? Absolutely. The we have opportunities to change the way we do business. And I'm going to use forestry as an example, but it, these similar values and approaches can apply to managing aquaculture on aquatic lands and agriculture issues. Um, I want us to always have a strong, healthy forest practices industry. We always, it's the evergreen state that built our economy. And, but it's important to remember 70%, I learned this recently, 70% of our logging and forest products come off of privately owned lands. So the state timberlands make up only 30%. And I think we can set a higher standard for our public lands than we do on those other lands. And the traditional way of doing business really is industrial clear cutting. And it is not particularly labor intensive. It's a very automated. Um, and those who uh, benefit really are the industry itself. And I think over time, there are, if we make some better decisions about where we harvest and how we harvest, we can achieve better environmental outcomes, but also do it in ways that's good for the workers. Um, for example, intensive selective thinning. Um, and, you know, there's a much less intensive harvest techniques and you can uh, that can generate the same amount of wood over time, the same product, same revenue for the state, uh, but can do it in a much more ecologically sustainable way and employ more folks in the woods. A lot of folks have suggested if we, instead of cutting trees every 40 years, you do it every 80 years, you actually can make more money, more than two times 40. There's a synergy there. Um, and in doing so throughout that time period, if you're in there thinning and pulling wood out for forest health and for wood products, you can actually end up with a much more worker focused system. The often the industry will blame the environmental community for their economic challenges. And what people forget is that the on private timberlands, Almost all of the logs, when uh, a private timber company owns it, they cut the trees down, almost entirely get shipped overseas. We don't do that off state lands, very, very little of that. Our, we feed the local mills. But what happens then is if we suggest, like I am, that in some targeted areas, we manage the forest for other benefits like um, carbon storage and recreation, even a small amount of that, the industry screams that we're the cause of shutting our mills down. And it reminds me of, you know, I'm sure you've heard this story, but picture a kitchen table and there's three people sitting around it. You have the CEO of a large timber company, you have a mill worker and you have an environmentalist and there's a plate of 12 cookies on the table. The CEO of the timber company takes 11 of the cookies and then they turn to the mill worker, point at the environmentalist and say, that environmentalist is trying to take your cookie. We can have a healthy robust economy. We can support rural economies, create good jobs, fund our public services, but do it in a, in a better way. And um, if there's time and there's some specific ideas that I'm recommending uh, that I'm excited to tackle. Well, certainly, I mean, you, you talk about the way in which the state uh, would deal with this differently than, as you say, the 70 percent of uh, private logging that, that happens here in Washington. Uh, moving from logging to fossil fuel, I want to ask you, in your time on King County Council, you led the charge to ban new fossil fuel 
facilities in King County. So then I'll ask you, what is that ultimately meant for us here in King County, both in terms of the environment and then also in terms of jobs? In some ways, we won't know what it means because we won't know what didn't what would have happened <laughs> that didn't. But we made a decision that both economically and for the health of the planet, that we need to move away from fossil fuels to clean energy. And in King County, we did everything we legally could within the constraints of federal laws to prohibit major new fossil fuel infrastructure, you know, pipelines, refineries, all that. We also uh, banned coal mining uh, as part of that. And the hope is that it, it becomes a decision factor in the market when people are, are planning for ener their energy future. And to know that in this area, it's going to, it's not going to be possible. Um, <clears throat> clean energy eventually is going to be cheaper, especially if we help with the transition and we have programs to do that. Uh, but I'm going to take that same philosophy to our state public lands. And that is, we shouldn't be using our public lands to facilitate the development of fossil fuel infrastructure. In fact, I want to do the opposite. Um, I'm proposing that we create a new trust. Basically, the state has a number, the revenue we generate from state lands goes into, depending where it comes from, goes, some of it goes to schools, some local governments. I would like to see the state acquire lands using existing funding programs in the state capital budget, like the natural climate solutions dollars, um, to purchase lands to help facilitate the development of clean energy, because we've been seeing a lot of conflict over in Eastern Washington. Um, there's this great desire. In fact, we have a state law um, that says we have to, utilities have to provide 100% of their energy from clean renewable energy sources by 2045. So we have, the state has created this demand for clean energy. And so large scale wind and solar development is out there looking to build. And that's starting to create conflicts, tribal conflicts, conflicts with other members of the community, but also there are ecological impacts even from clean energy deployment, you know, uh, kind of over on the Columbia Plateau, there's sage lands over there, shrub step habitat that's important for wildlife. And so if we don't do this right, it's really messy. And I would like to build on something that the Wazoo Energy Office was doing. They had kind of a pilot program where they brought all those folks together and they looked at okay, to ask the tribal nations, where are the special lands that are need to be set aside? They went work with the environmental community. Where are the key valued sage land properties? And then they worked with the energy developers. Where's the most geographically valuable in terms of their geographic attributes and mapped yeah. that out so that we know where is the best spot. The state could facilitate that by using these programs to then acquire those properties for leasing for clean energy development. And then that revenue would go into a new trust that could go back into local communities for rural economic development. And I'd like to see some of it also go into helping low-income communities with the transition to clean energy, members of low-income communities um, to build on what utilities are already doing. Right. And so I think it can be a new body of work where we not only should be precluding fossil fuel development, we need to be helping facilitate smart, ecologically thoughtful, sensitive to tribal uh, lands implementation of clean energy. And I think it's one of the exciting parts of this job. And it, there hasn't been, I think there's a lot of room for us to play a big role there. There are certainly so many moving parts with this, as you say, and a lot of considerations, including uh, environmental justice is something that I, I want to get to in just a moment. But uh, I do want to ask you about wildfire prevention, because I know this is one of your priorities. Um, we know that this is a growing problem, a, a huge concern. Uh, we have now a smoke season. This is relatively new to us here in Washington. What more can be done here? Sure. Uh, wildfire prevention and response needs to be a top priority, not only for public safety, but also, as you mentioned, our public health. You know, the smoke we've experienced from the recent wildfires creates health risks, and it does so disproportionately on already marginalized community members. So that's why we need to do more to continually improve our prevention efforts. And uh, I'm committed to wildfire prevention and working with fire and forestry professionals to develop a detailed agenda over time. But and initially, I think we need to place a greater emphasis on things like prescribed burns and non-commercial thinning to not just manage wildfire prevention, 
but it has the added benefit of, of managing forest health as well. And this means working to address some of the barriers to local level training and support. Uh, I know they've struggled to get uh, dedicated funding and capacity to do that work, particularly with their local partners. So I'd like to see some dedicated funding there. Uh, I also am interested in pursuing effectiveness monitoring to get better information on how those different forest health treatments, what's working, what's not working. I I'm make glad sure that you mentioned that because it does seem, at least in certain corners of the state, like where I am here in unincorporated King County, that the last year or so hasn't been as bad. So how are you measuring this in terms of what's effective? Is it just sort of, is it luck? How much of this goes, uh, is, is attributed to the work that, that can be done on, on behalf of DNR and public lands? Yep, I think some of the recent success is due to increased investments on the part of the legislature. I think this will be Commissioner Franz's legacy is the work securing funding to dramatically improve our wildfire response. Um, one of the things you learn in local government, we do emergency management, there's four phases, uh, prevention, preparation, response, and recovery. And too often we focus on response and sadly recovery. And uh, we've made big investments in response you know, way more aviation equipment, better positioning of resources, better technology. We're one of the best states. And I think that has been part of the reason. But with climate change, things are getting drier. We're seeing shifts, patterns. This, this problem is not going to go away. And I want to see us continuing to move upstream to the prevention side. It's I know it's a cliche. And so I apologize. The whole ounce of prevention, mm -hmm. pound the cure. And I, I worry that, you know, sometimes those in the fire profession focus everything. Oh, I'm, we're going to go fight the fires. That's the key. No, we need to prevent the fires. And good forest health and forest management is one of the key pieces. And I'll tell you what doesn't work is, um, and they're, the industry back candidates in this race argue that, that the way to manage forest fires is through sustainable harvest. You go out and you cut the trees down. And uh, the science I have seen is that these older, mature forests when managed properly, uh, provide are much more fire resistant than the monoculture tree stands. And so I think part of the strategy needs to be focusing upstream on forest health, needs to be on preserving our mature legacy forests and, uh, and then managing those. I don't think we've put the resources in we need to on that prevention side, the forest health, the prescribed burns, non-commercial thinning. And, uh, and I know sometimes the prescribed burns are not popular, but I guarantee you, they're much better than having everything go up in, in flames. You know, you anticipated a question that I had about uh, Republican uh, candidates uh, who are backed by the timber industry and, and the danger. Really, Republican. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and there, there are others as well, but I think most noteworthy, the, the most noteworthy ones are the ones who potentially uh, pose the greatest danger to our state's ecosystem if they were elected to the position. Um, I, I know that you are dedicated to the preservation of mature legacy forests. This is something we touched on earlier that I wanted to come back to. So it is my understanding that the State Department of Natural Resources, DNR, has been bringing a lot of these trees to auction and that the stock is now reduced to about 3% of DNR's forest holdings. First, before I proceed, do I have that right? Yes, that's the number I've been using, about 70. You can define them using different ecological metrics, but about 3%, about 77,000 acres, give or take a little. Yeah. I understand that these growths represent a minority of, of tree growth, but can store up to 50% of carbon uh, of the carbon of, of, say, newer growth. Uh, I'd love to call on your education background here. In layman's terms, can you talk just roughly about how that works? Sure. Um, the like you said, there the next commissioner of public lands has an opportunity, or I think a responsibility, to protect a special subset of forests we have. These are, I call them the not quite old growth, but they're on their way. How to old are we talking about then? These tend to be, uh, and and age isn't the only definitional factor. It's about they they uh, usually defined by being naturally regenerated. So these are not tree farms. Structurally complex. Usually, you know it when you walk into it. You know, structurally complex means you got trees and, and plants all different sizes and they hold have the most biodiversity and they store the most carbon. And, um, you know, the Pacific Northwest lowland evergreen forests are one of the largest carbon sinks in the world. And the industry likes to gaslight. They say the way to a healthy planet and helping climate change is to cut them down and replant them. 
um, and they're wrong. That's like when the tobacco industry told us that smoking cigarettes is good for your health. Um, the reality is, for the certainly for the next 30 or 40 years, when you go in and you clear cut uh, these older forests, you have a large net carbon loss for the next 30, 40 years. Eventually, as new trees grow up, they will um, begin to catch up on the carbon storage. But very little is actually stored in wood products, less than 20%. Uh, and there's a lot of carbon expended um, um, to do the harvesting. And so um, one of the best things we can do um, for climate change is to preserve these mature legacy forests. As you said, they make up a tiny fraction of our state forest lands, but they have that outsized impact on climate. And the cool thing that I, it's important to mention here is we can do this. And, and let me be clear on day one as lands commissioner, literally on the first day, I'm going to sign a mature forest policy that ends the destruction of our mature legacy forests. And not just as a political gimmick, but I think in terms of just organizational management, it's, I need to be clear about the decision is being made and then we'll work towards implementing it so we don't spend the first six months of a term arguing about it. So we're going to do that. Um, but we can do it and we can still, as I said, support these local rural economies and funding for these public services. And we can do it by acquiring replacement lands over, the, you know, in the short term, there's plenty of other timber parcels, you know, uh, to harvest. So in the short term, there's no real change. But over time, uh, we can use, uh, assuming voters defend the Climate Commitment Act, we have funding from the Climate Commitment Act called Natural Climate Solutions. And that can that pot of funding can be used to acquire timber lands. And what I want to do is acquire tim private timber lands at risk of conversion. Because what the on that 70% that's private timber lands, these big timber companies, they come in, they clear cut, and then often they just unload it for development and sprawl. And that's a great opportunity for the state DNR to acquire those lands and then put them back into tree farming and for, you know, and forestry to continue to generate the revenue. And it's kind of a win-win in terms of preventing the sprawl and keeping some of those, those jobs. And we're seeing a lot more risk of that sprawl after COVID. Everyone's on Zoom. You've probably seen the headlines, population booming in Darrington and Arlington because people can work elsewhere. So we're going to have to be, the state can play a role sort of in growth management here that can be a, a real win-win. So this is one of the issues that really motivated me to run this summer was meeting with conservation activists. You've probably noticed this, that often as elected officials at whatever level, we nibble around problems. And then we pat ourselves on the back because we changed the formula of a subcommittee or whatever it is. It can be enormously frustrating for people watching from the sidelines. Yes, absolutely. Or we're working on things that are very aspirational. We're working to end poverty. We're the things that are. And I see in this job the opportunity to be able to do something big uh, and meaningful and achievable. And that is the signature of a lands commissioner is required for all the, these property sales. So I can on day one in the destruction of these mature legacy forests. And if nothing else happens, if, if the legislature goes into Republican hands, or whatever, I mean, that alone is a legacy worth fighting for. Um, and, but I also have confidence the legislature will do, won't undo it. I've had a lot of conversations with legislative leadership and I think it's defensible in the courts. So I think we can do this and then we can move on uh, to what else can we do on our public lands. And it, it excites me. It's what gets me up to, to work on this. Well, certainly you have those relationships in the legislature from, from your years there, but also, as you say, this is a position where things can be both aspirational and effective that you can on day one prevent the DNR from selling off this old growth forest. Uh, so uh, I, I know this is terrific news to a lot of people uh, listening who are very concerned about this. Um, I, I, we had talked about your uh, pledge to center environmental justice yep. um, as part of your work. And I, I want to dig into that just a little bit, starting by talking really about how, and you're, you're, you've discussed a lot of this already, but just the way in which environmental issues can you know, disproportionately impact poor and marginalized communities and, and how that can inform your approach to solutions. Yep. And it's, it's sort of shaped by my life experience too. You know, I came out of the closet the year I first ran for office and my mentor at the time said, I love you, Dave, 
but it's too bad because you can't run for office because this was a long time ago. And the thought of an out gay legislator deep in the working class suburbs of South King County was absolutely unheard of. But I ran and won and made history as the first out LGBT legislator outside Seattle in the history of our state. And I just mentioned that because what drove me then still drives me today. It's that passion for justice, LGBT equality, racial equality, gender equality, fighting for tribal treaty rights, labor rights. I'm the son of a father with disabilities. I'm the brother of someone who's overcome addiction and criminal justice involvement. So this commitment to justice is personal. And when it comes to our public lands, environmental justice, in my mind, means recognizing that climate change disproportionately impacts low-income communities and communities of color. And our solutions have to reduce those disparities, not make them worse. And environmental justice means honoring and respecting tribal treaty rights and strengthening the co-management role of tribes. Uh, it also means improving the way in which we do business at the Department of Natural Resources to be more inclusive. A few specific things I want to do. Number one, we have a environmental justice law in this state that requires an, uh, environmental justice assessments on certain major agency actions. A whole lot of the actions at DNR were exempted from that law. And, but there's nothing that says you can't do them. So as commissioner, I intend to go beyond the requirements in the law and conduct environmental justice assessments on more of this, the agency major actions, specifically those actions um, around timber sales. Those were the whole, those were exempt. So that's one thing I want to do. I also want to work to diversify both, uh, the department, particular a wildfire response. These are these are tough jobs, but these are really good jobs. And it's basically white dudes. It's predominantly male, white field. And we need to work target um, specific strategies to make that workforce more attractive to people from all backgrounds. Uh, and and just be consistent also in how we recruit and hire at the agency. But one area that I think we have some opportunities, and this bureaucracy is intimidating to me, but um, there's apparently almost 100 boards and commissions and task forces and standing committees within the department that advise the work and, and guide the work. And there's a, something called a board and commissions plan, a report that's sitting on a shelf, and it calls for diversifying these. And I'd like to really focus on making sure that all of these community-based entities that are informing our work are reflective of the diversity of the communities. And then secondly, actually listen to them, build in some a little bit more authority to that is one area. And a, a final area, and I, I need to verify these stats, but I, I was told there might be almost 20 folks working in the communications department in the commissioner's office helping communicate, you know, speech writers, videographers, you know, four or five people on the social media team. I would like to kind of reprioritize within existing resources and shift some of that to authentic community engagement in the field. Um, I wouldn't mind having someone to help with communications in my office, but we don't need 20 people for God's sake. But we do need people out in the regional offices helping people connect Let's get the Board of Natural Resources more, you know, someone to help so that people can get access to information faster. I also think sure. that we have some hidden gems. There are regional offices all over the state. It's one of the challenge management challenges here. Um, often the people in those regional offices have the relationships in the community, yet we structure some of our outreach and community engagement out of headquarters. And so that's where some of those resources could go is to making sure they have the resources and tools to use the skill we the skills we have there and and finally i want to diversify the board of natural resources itself i don't get to control that but i will certainly advocate for legislation that includes community members and ideally from marginalized communities that includes tribal representation small forest landowners those are the ones who oversee these decisions on the timber sales as well so that's a handful of the many things we can be doing to bring to life that commitment to justice Diversifying the board, I think, is leaping out to a, a lot of people, uh, but you certainly have discussed and laid out a number of, of, of wonderful ways in which you would center uh, diversity and environmental justice. 
I would like you to take your hat off as a candidate for a moment and really just as an expert, as somebody, uh, somebody who's you, I, I, you're, you're miming taking for those of you who are, are just listening, uh, the council members mime taking his hat off. Uh, but you know, I want to get your thoughts on how we push back against uh, 2117. We have an awful lot of activists listening right now. Um, this would uh, roll back the Climate Commitment Act and also the cap and trade program. And I wonder how you think we can really effectively message here about this initiative to convey not just the good that these programs do, but also to communicate that they are in no way responsible for the increased costs that people are seeing at places like the pump. The Climate Commitment Act is a critical tool for investing in the future of the state of Washington, and we need to uphold that and vote against repealing the Climate Commitment Act. Um, the best arguments, I believe, and those that I've even seen polling supports um, are to help people understand where the dollars go uh, and that those investments do go back. And I think as a candidate for state lands commissioner, what I will talk about is the ability to do things like preserving these older forests. If we want to do that in a way that still supports rural economies, this is our funding source for replacement lands. Um, if we want to help speed up the deployment of clean energy infrastructure so people can eventually get cleaner, cheaper energy, this is the funding source to acquire lands for a new clean energy trust. Um, so I think there's no nothing wrong with make, having that be the centerpiece of the argument. Um, the best argument I've heard from me that resonated with me was someone who had driven across the border to Oregon and said, you know, the gas prices here were just the same. Mm. That yeah. alone, that little talking point was like, well, for God's sake, <laughs> like it. Well, certainly, I think when you know you hear people talking about uh, inflation being a factor in this year's uh, national election, and certainly the world has been impacted by inflation. It isn't just here in the United States. Um, you've given us so much to think about here. Uh, before I let you go, uh, I think it's uh, interesting for folks to note, and and interesting for me in particular, that you've served as a basketball referee for youth sports. Um, and I, I, that is something that has just always seemed incredibly stressful to me. Is, is that a kind of a stressful gig to be out there uh, refereeing? Well, you know, I did, I, I'm taking a break now, but I refereed for many years for youth, high school and adult basketball leagues. What I actually discovered is there are many similarities between my job as a referee and as an elected official. Do tell. You know, in both cases, only you know in your heart if you're being fair and doing the best job you can. Uh, in both cases, there are people literally yelling at you while you're trying to do your job often. <laughs> and in both cases, when the game's over, you slink off the court, disappear, and everyone's mad at you. <laughs> so it's... Uh, it's been but you practice. do get your steps in, right? Even if you're running backwards. You yes. your steps oh, in. you get a, a, several miles a game. And I used to do 10 games a weekend and, you know, it was a good. Wow. I, 10 uh, games a weekend yeah, for some tournament games and, it, you know, some tournament weekends. Well, council member Upgrove, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time today. We really appreciate it. You bet. And folks can check me out at upthegrove.org. Upthegrove.org. We'll have that in our show notes. Thank you again. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> 